Um, my name is Philip. Uh, I have quite a bit of uh, uh, content to go through, uh, and I'm a bit late, so I figured I would add the uh, uh, definition of a domain uh, collision in the title slide. Uh, and also, I'll skip the uh, uh, intro slide about me. If you want to know about me, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, do a quick introduction on how uh, we started this research. Uh, and then we'll cover as quickly as possible some definitions that I think are important. Uh, and uh, lastly, we'll get into the fun stuff on uh, uh, the research and some example that we uh, that we found. Uh, so uh, at the end of last year, uh, we were hired by an IT uh, um, service company. I changed the name of the company um, to perform a red team engagement. Uh, the client uh, um, of the companies included a bunch of uh, financial institution and large manufacturing uh, firm. Companies had about uh, 300 employees with strong IT backgrounds, uh, which uh, would make uh, social engineering a little bit more challenging, and they had a fairly uh, limited external uh, footprint. Uh, looking at the external uh, attack surface, uh, we um, uh, found an exchange uh, server that supported NTLM uh, authentication. Uh, the cool thing with uh, uh, NTLM challenge response protocol is that uh, a uh, client can send a uh, NTLM SSP request uh, target in the first packet, and it will force the server uh, to uh, respond uh, with some information about the target uh, uh, in his uh, uh, challenge message. Nmap has a built-in script about it, uh, and then uh, you can uh, extract uh, the name of the internal uh, uh, domain uh, from that. So for this client, uh, the name uh, of the internal domain was initech.lrc, uh, which uh, is actually a valid domain name uh, since 2018 when LLC became a public uh, fully qualified uh, um, a TLD. Uh, so with the uh, fully qualified domain name, uh, we checked, and even better, uh, the domain name uh, was available for purchase. So they were using it internally, but they didn't buy the, the domain, probably because they didn't know. So we registered the domain, uh, and we set up a DNS server, and then uh, uh, um, we wanted to check if there was any internal traffic that would be uh, leaked to the internet. Within 15 minutes, uh, we started to record uh, quite a bit of traffic, uh, including some interesting uh, hits. Uh, for example, uh, end user uh, having a web proxy uh, auto discovery or WPAD um, uh, leaking on the internet. And we also noted some other uh, traffic indicative of uh, Active Directory domain. Uh, this specific request is uh, typically a workstation attached to a domain that is trying to uh, um, find its uh, domain controller through a DNS SRV uh, query. Microsoft has a whole uh, uh, detailed article to explain all the type of requests uh, that a uh, domain attached workstation uh, uh, will send to find the relevant server on an Active Directory uh, uh, environment. As you can imagine, uh, sending this type of request uh, over the uh, internet uh, is not a good idea. So next, uh, we configured some DNS record uh, to point uh, um, this uh, DNS uh, to a server running responder, and sure enough, within a few seconds, a few minutes, uh, we collected uh, some ashes, threw these ashes in Ashcat, and got some domain uh, credential. Uh, with the domain credential, got onto the VPN, uh, and got access to the internal network. At this point, I'm sure you're asking, oh, wait, they didn't have uh, uh, MFA? Well, initially, we didn't think they had MFA either. Uh, we got on the VPN, no problem. And then when we uh, presented the result to the client, the client asked us, what did you bypass MFA? And we're like, what MFA? Uh, turned out that they were uh, using this type of MFA, which is just a, a push notification, and you can just approve or deny. And the user just randomly approved our connection, so we got in. <laughs> it was pretty easy uh, red team engagement. Um, so what happened? Uh, what went wrong uh, on the wire? Well, in a normal situation, when John is in the office uh, and he opens his uh, web browser, the web browser will uh, uh, ask the DNS uh, resolver uh, for uh, the WPAD, the, the name of the domain, so any tech or LLC in this case. Uh, mo in most of the case on an internal network, your DNS uh, will be the domain controller, which has a zone uh, for its own name, uh, and then we'll look up for the WPAD, return the IP address to John, and John's browser will happily uh, um, go to the address and find the proxy.pack uh, uh, or the pack file um, to set up a proxy for his browser. Now, uh, what happens when John is working from the office? Well, when he opens his browser, his browser will still uh, reach out to the DNS resolver, except that this time, the DNS resolver is his home router. Uh, 
And because uh, initech.lc is a valid, public, uh, fully qualified domain name, it will follow out the request to its ISP and so on until it reach the authoritative uh, name server for initech.lc, which was our server. Uh, so at this point, uh, we can uh, return any IP address, IP address that we want to John's browser, and John's will happily, uh, um, browser will happily open um, the proxy.pack that we serve him, uh, and then uh, we uh, own his browser. Some definitions, so, um, before we dive into the, the goal stuff. Um, so the uh, uh, LRC extension that we discussed earlier, it's actually called a top-level domain. Uh, I can manage the assignment of these TLDs, uh, and there are several categories of TLDs. There's generic TLDs that are the most common, uh, that are generally open for anyone uh, to register. They also have country code uh, TLDs uh, that are typically uh, two letters that are assigned to countries and sovereign states, and they uh, also have some sponsored top-level domain like edu, gov, mil, int, uh, that are a little bit more restricted for registration. Up until 2013, uh, ICANN had about uh, eight, or oh, just eight, uh, GTLDs. And then in 2013, um, ICANN decided to launch a program uh, to uh, create new TLDs. Between 2013 and 2016, uh, there's 1,200 new GTLDs uh, that were introduced. And if it was not enough, ICANN is preparing to do another GTLD uh, program in April 2026, so if you're interested, uh, the application open next week. Uh, now the real question is why uh, did ICANN decide to increase the number of GTLD by 15,000% uh, after safely operating uh, uh, the uh, DNS infrastructure for more than 25 years? Well, the answer is easy, for money. Um, ICANN is making a lot of money uh, from the applicant of these new GTLDs. Uh, first, uh, when you apply for a GTLDs, you have to pay a lot of money. Um, and then if there's more than two companies uh, that are disputing uh, a GTLDs, then ICANN will put it for, for, uh, for auction and will make even more money. Uh, on top of that, uh, they are making recurring revenues, so every year, now there's 1200, uh, over 1200 GTLDs um, that are making money from it. And they're also making uh, money from the registrar that are selling the domains from these GTLDs. Since uh, ICANN is a non-profit organization, uh, we can look at their uh, financial report and uh, we can figure out that uh, last year they made 89 million by just uh, recurring revenue uh, from these GTLDs. On top of that, they made 53 million uh, from the registrar. And because it's a non-profit organization and they were making so much money, they uh, created a fund, separate fund from the non-profit, of 270 million for the special project to save the internet. Um, of course, uh, for the business to be uh, to work, uh, ICANN cannot be the only one making money, so the GTLD operator are also making a lot of uh, money. Uh, first, by selling the domain, usually at a discount price because it's a pretty competitive market. Uh, but also uh, the main uh, revenue maker is from the renewal of these domains. And here are some numbers uh, that uh, these GTLDs are making. That's per year. Um, so with all this, uh, the next question is, but, uh, you must be wondering, um, is ICANN doing something to prevent uh, this name collision? Well, of course they do. Otherwise, it wouldn't be uh, responsible, right? So in 2013, uh, when they introduced all these GTLDs, uh, they ordered a, uh, a study from a company called Jazz Global Advis Advisor, I think. Uh, and they came up with a nice report that suggests to put in place a name collision occurrence management framework. Sounds like a pretty expensive uh, research, just from the name of it. Uh, and what does the framework suggest? Well, first, they suggest to restrict high-risk strings, like home, corp, or mail. Um, but variation of these strings, like home with an S or email, are still fine, and I can decide to uh, sell those GTLDs. Um, they also suggest to do a control interruption for a continuous period of no less than 90 days, and we'll see in the next slide what it means. And lastly, uh, the registry, so the registry operator, uh, must respond to a name collision uh, uh, report from ICANN within 24 hours. So what is a, a control collision? Well, uh, when John is walking from the office and is opening his browser and is trying to reach a uh, newly uh, uh, TLD that uh, has not been uh, public yet, but just uh, assign uh, to a, a GTLD operator. For the first 90 days, uh, the ICANN force this TLD 
um, the TRD name server to return a specific value of uh, 127.53.53. And this IP will go back all the way to John's uh, uh, workstation, and I can expect John or John C. admin uh, to uh, figure out uh, in their logs that this IP address appeared and there's something wrong. Except that um, uh, WPAD or the other protocol are a resilient protocol, so if uh, the browser cannot find a valid WPAD, uh, the browser will fall back to a direct connection, and John will have access to the internet anyway. So what do you think of this control interruption? That's my take on it. Um, they are just interested in making money. They don't really um, care about the uh, name collision. So let's focus on the methodology. We wanted to find how widespread uh, this issue was uh, that we found uh, during our red team engagement. Name collision is not new. It's been around and, and discussed since the early 2010s. Um, so this, there was three main objectives in the research. Uh, was, was one was to find the internal domains that are leaked externally. Then for all these domains, we are trying to match the one that uh, became a valid, uh, fully qualified domain name since 2013 when they introduced all these new TGRDs. And lastly, uh, for all the ones that now have a public, fully qualified domain name, we wanted to see if they were registered or not. Um, the first uh, step to uh, um, find uh, internal domain names uh, leaked on the internet. There's plenty of ways to do it. Uh, one is looking at banners. Uh, SMTP is usually pretty verbose and gives the internal name of the server, not necessarily uh, uh, its uh, external name. Uh, Self-signed certificate. By nature, in order to do a self-signed certificate, you don't necessarily need to own or operate the domain. Uh, and there's a lot of internal uh, machines that uh, use their internal fully qualified domain name uh, on this self-signed certificate. Uh, you can also look in the CRL, or the Certificate Revocation, revocation List, sorry, uh, on the SSL certificate. If you have an internal CA, it's likely that uh, your uh, internal CA name uh, will be in the Certificate Revocation List. Uh, we can also look at uh, email headers. Uh, here we have Thierry from SFR uh, in France that sent an email to a mailing list, and the message ID will tell us that their internal uh, domain is ankara.local.ads which is not registered, by the way. Um, also, NTR norm authentication. We saw it earlier. Uh, there's a way to uh, leak the internal name, uh, or domain uh, name. And also, with all the TLS uh, services, remote desktop, etc., cetera, that uh, usually have a self-signed certificate attached to it. So now that we uh, had a bunch of, uh, of ways of getting these domains, uh, we had to focus only on the domains that are prone to collision. There's 1,200, so we couldn't pick all of them. Um, so we picked a few uh, CCTLDs, so country TLDs, that are likely uh, to be used internally and, and create confusion or collision. Uh, AD for Active Directory, which is actually Andorra. Uh, MS, that is used even by Microsoft, uh, is actually uh, uh, Montserrat. .io, .ai, .ws, and .co. We also looked at GTLDs, uh, mainly generic business terms like company, the .group, the .tech, uh, and common legal entities uh, like we saw at .lc, .inc, uh, limited, SRL, etc. And also ambiguous or common uh, technical terms like host, zone, site, dev, box, and cloud. And the last step was to check uh, the registration status uh, of the uh, fully qualified domain name that we uh, identified. It should be fairly easy. Uh, you just check the WUIs, and then you can tell right away if the domain is registered or not. Well, the WUIs have a pretty strict rate limiting, and after about 100 checks, uh, we got banned for 90 days. Uh, so that was not really a viable uh, option. So we uh, readjust uh, the process. Instead of looking at the uh, WUIs, we actually uh, extracted any records that we could find uh, for each of these fully qualified domain name. If there is a DNS record, that obviously means that the domain is registered, uh, so we'll put it aside. Uh, we'll continue if there is no DNS record. That doesn't necessarily mean that the domain is registered, but it could be that the domain is either not used or misconfigured. Um, so next step, we'll check uh, via some uh, API calls to registrar if the domain is available for registration. Uh, if it is um, not really, uh, available for registration, it's either registered or it's blacklisted. There's some uh, world names that are, uh, names that are uh, restricted. And if it's available for registration, then it's a, it's a win. 
Uh, we added later in uh, our research uh, a step to extract the name server for all the domain that we found that were registered, extract the name server and feed it back into the process, and you'll see later that we actually found some cool stuff as well uh, with name server that were not uh, all properly configured. So now some uh, uh, funny examples. Uh, the first time, the first one that we uh, ran into uh, was a domain uh, called MMRTCC. Uh, we found um, over 3,000 uh, self-signed certificates with different machine name, mainly starting with a P and a uh, number uh, that look like workstation machines, uh, and the domain was uh, not registered. Doing some further research, uh, we found a uh, report from the Memphis Police Department from 2013, where on page 36, uh, they explained to us that uh, through a strategic planning, they uh, upgraded their uh, NT4 infrastructure uh, to a uh, brand new uh, Active Directory. And in the uh, top of the article, um, here they give you the name of the uh, of the domain. So. Uh, we learned in the report that RTCC uh, means real-time crime center. Sounds pretty cool. Uh, it is actually pretty cool. Uh, that's what it looks like. That's the Memphis uh, real-time crime center. Uh, it's basically a feed to all the CCTV cameras uh, in the city uh, and more. And uh, all the police uh, uh, patrol car, patrol car uh, have access to the uh, real-time crime center to check for license plate, etc. And we learned later that the P and the number was actually the number of the, the number of the patrol car. So what would you we did next? Well, of course, we registered the domain. We couldn't stop here. Um, so we registered the domain. Unfortunately, a few uh, uh, hours later, we got an email from the registrar telling us that in order to register the domain in Andorra, you need to have a trademark. So what did we do next? Well, we found a trademark. Uh, uh, lawyer in Andorra and ask us, to ask them the process, and it's actually seemed pretty easy, too easy. Uh, you just need to give them the trademark, your name, sign a power of attorney, pay 200 euros, uh, 300 euros, and two weeks later, uh, you get a trademark. So we did it. We didn't think it would work. And sure enough, two weeks later, uh, we got a trademark from MRTCC.ad. That was a pretty cool way. Um, so uh, once we had the domain, we set up a DNS server, and within a few days, uh, we recorded about uh, 1.3 million uh, uh, record, obviously all from uh, uh, internal network uh, traffic. We also set up a uh, mail server, and we started to receive some mail, internal mail uh, that was misrouted uh, uh, to us. Uh, as much as I wanted to continue the, the, the test, uh, we decided to report it uh, to uh, the Memphis uh, DPT CIO uh, on April 2nd. We had to wait one day because I didn't want to report it on April 1st. Uh, <laughs> um, the next day, we followed up because we figured it was kind of sketchy to receive an email from a random uh, guy on the internet saying, we own your domain. Um, no response. So a few weeks later, I tried to follow up with his boss, the CIO of the Memphis uh, um, uh, city. Uh, he looked at my LinkedIn profile, but they never responded. Um, <laughs> didn't take too much offense, but um, so we figured we'll report it directly to Homeland Security since uh, it is a poli uh, affecting a police department. So we reported it a week later. Uh, still no response. Um, through some personal connection, I managed to uh, connect with a FBI special agent in uh, Memphis. I'm not sure he really understood everything I explained uh, about the risk, uh, but he gave us the contact and he put us in touch with the uh, IT security manager uh, of uh, the city of Memphis. So we sent him a long email and uh, we waited and he never responded. So we... <laughs> changed our approach, and then we uh, spoke with Brian Krebs, who is an uh, 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 investigative reporter, uh, who was interested in the, in the story and uh, started to work on it. Coincidence, two weeks later, or a week later, we got an email from the entity security manager. Spoiler alert, that was not a coincidence. Um, and they asked us, how oh, can we get this domain back from, uh, to us? Uh, so we did transfer the domain back to them. Uh, and on uh, August 3rd, 23rd, uh, Brian uh, published an article. Um, so AD was actually a, a pretty interesting uh, TLD. Um, overall, it's a fairly small TLD. There's uh, only 1,100 uh, domain registered for this TLD. Uh, when we did our research, we found about 3,000 uh, trusted SSL certificates, which is 
uh, about expected, that's the, about the, the average, except that we found 25,000 self-signed certificates, uh, which indicate that there's a lot more people using this TLDs than uh, the one using it uh, um, as they should. Out of this uh, 25,000 uh, self-signed certificate, there's like 2,700 unique fully qualified domain name. So when you know that there's more fully qualified domain name that we extracted than the actual registered name, we kind of know that something is off. Uh, and then pretty much all the domains that we uh, uh, found on these TLDs are not registered, and 89% are not registered and used internally. So next, well, like, I, what are the other cool uh, .ad that we could register? Well, we went after local.ad, internal.ad, and followed the same process. We paid like 300 bucks, got the trademarks for these two um, <laughs> TLDs, and set up our DNS. And then we recorded in the first few days about 7 million requests, uh, DNS requests uh, to these domains. Uh, and all of this were internal uh, uh, networks. We found over uh, looking through the logs for a few months uh, about 1,200 different domains of companies uh, colliding with these domains. So as opposed to the main RTCC that was easy to uh, transfer to a unique company, uh, here we have 1,200 companies fighting for the same domain, so we can't really sell it to anyone. Or maybe we could, but we didn't yet. Um, so in 2020, uh, speaking to Brian Krebs, uh, we learned that Microsoft actually purchased the corp.com uh, domain before it was put for auction because of the same thing. It was uh, colliding with a lot of uh, 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 domain and companies. So we reached out to uh, Microsoft uh, to ask them, but the only way to reach out to Microsoft is through the MSRC, and he didn't make it through the triage. They're like, what are you talking about? That's not a vulnerability. Um, so we asked them for an official statement for the presentation, and they decided to reopen the ticket, and now it's transferred to their DNS team, uh, and I'll keep you posted. Uh, they emailed me yesterday. Uh, another cool example is the .box. Uh, .box is a new TLD that is in the blockchain. Sounds fancy. Um, they opened earlier this year in uh, uh, January uh, 2024. I'm sure you all, most of you are familiar with the Fritzbox. Uh, Fritzbox is a cool router, router, and you connect to the router through an address called fritz.box. Uh, the DHCP router, uh, the DHCP server on this router is also assigning a fritz.box DNS suffix. That means that every time you mistype a name or a name that doesn't exist, uh, the fritz.box will be uh, uh, added to the end of the address and we'll try to resolve it. And because it's a valid TLD now, it will make it to the internet. So we thought we would uh, uh, register this domain. Unfortunately, it was already registered. Um, so looking at the timeline, January 18th is when the uh, new TLD became uh, public for registration. January 22nd, uh, somebody registered fritz.box, o2.box, and wpad.box. Uh, cool thing is it's in the blockchain, so we uh, know we can track all the domains that they bought that day. Um, the domain fritz.box on the same day uh, was listed on OpenSea, which is an NFT uh, marketplace for 420 ether real, about a million dollar. Uh, nobody bought it, so they released it the next uh, week for uh, 99 Ethereal, or $250,000. Nobody bought it again. Uh, but there started to be some uh, uh, noise uh, on forums of users complaining about having funky uh, internet connection and funky resolutions of internal names. Uh, so AVM, the manufacturer, uh, opened a complaint to WIPO, which is the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is pretty much the only way you can get a domain uh, back uh, that somebody else registered, uh, and they investigated the issue, and on April 2012, because the owner of the Fritz.box never responded to them, go figure, uh, they decided to reassign uh, the domain to uh, AVM. So with that in mind, we're like, all right, there must be some other routers uh, that uh, does the same thing. And sure enough, uh, we found uh, Sphere.box, which is a cool router uh, manufactured in Germany, has been bought by uh, Zixel. Uh, that is used by a few ISPs. And same thing, that this time the domain was available, and same thing, uh, the router uh, DHCP server um, assigned a sphere on that box uh, to the DNS suffix. So we bought the domain, again, set up the DNS, got about uh, 2.5 million uh, it in the first uh, uh, few days. So we tried to report it to Zixel, uh, and Zixel, I'm not sure they really understood. They are like, yeah, no, that's not really, uh, we don't think it's uh, uh, traffic from internal network, plus it's coming from all over the world, all our customers are in Germany, uh, that's not a, uh, a risk. 
They didn't really understand that. We sent the Rolox from the DNS, so there was a lot of probes. It was not all coming from Germany, but only 95% was coming from Germany. Um, so we followed up with an email and showed them like a screenshot of us capture, or actually a video of us capturing about 100 credential in a, a couple of minutes. Uh, and then they reassess, uh, and they, uh, reach back to us to, uh, acquire the domain. Uh, since we're in Luxembourg, we figured uh, we'll do some research on um, uh, uh, Luxembourg uh, as well. We found about uh, 8,000 uh, self-signed certificates in the CN on the uh, subject alternative name uh, from the census database. Uh, that's um, resulted in about 2,600 uh, unique domain. And out of this uh, 2,600 uh, uh, domains, 459 were not registered. Uh, we registered a couple. We did some investigation. We found at least one municipality, one uh, fire rescue station, one school, two government organizations, and a bank uh, that are using uh, domains that are not registered. We registered it for them, and we're working with a circle to uh, get the domain to the rightful owner. Another cool one that we found is Infonet, which is a network operator that uh, had a domain that expired in 2019. I guess they stopped operating in Luxembourg. Um, but if you remember earlier, I told you that for all the domains that actually uh, were registered, we still extracted the DNS and then we feed it back in the loop. That's how we found this one. And we actually found a bunch of domain names that are registered but are still pointing to a DNS that doesn't exist anymore. Um, so we registered the domain and now we own about 50 domains that were attached to this uh, uh, DNS uh, server. Another cool thing is Infonet also own 2 slash 25 uh, and the technical contact uh, for uh, these uh, two networks are still uh, a guy with his infonet.lu email address that we have now. Um, so in uh, conclusion, I'll uh, quote uh, the vice president of ICANN uh, in charge of DNS that said that a long-lasting solution to eliminate the potential issue arising from name collision in the private name space comes from implementing a fully qualified domain name. And we figure we'll fix this quote by adding that you actually registered. Uh, some numbers, uh, throughout the research, we uh, analyzed about 25, 26 million uh, certificates, about 7 uh, million uh, NTLM banners or, or domains extracted from the NTLM authentication. We found 89,000 uh, domains that were not registered. We registered about 115 of them. We can't register all of them. We already spent 6,000 uh, euros uh, on this. Uh, and then we recorded about 600 million uh, DNS records in the past six months that we did this uh, research. And so far, we got $220 uh, back for the domain. Uh, so that's not really worth it. Uh, so I want to thank my company for sponsoring this research. Uh, and uh, that's it. I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, thank you very much. So a very interesting talk. Uh, yeah, WPAD is fun. It's uh, it's actually much worse than that because it starts with DHCP first, but that's a different thing. <laughs> um, the, the why didn't you start by looking at passive DNS requests? Because you would have seen there. Uh, the domain names that are requested without any answer, and you would have found the patterns. Yeah, that's uh, actually a very good point. We should have done. <laughs> we realized after that we had we could get access to this uh, passive DNS. We didn't have access to a lot of uh, uh, this data, so uh, we did it the other way around, which is slightly less efficient. Um, but yeah, <laughs> but, but larger. You yeah, would have much larger and and fully qualified domain names would not help with uh, WPAD because the WPAD will actually do name uh, devo what is called name devolution. Yep. So it would remove the the last bit and then try and try and try everything up to the end. Yep. That's so. Yeah, that's we couldn't cover everything in our research, but we also rec uh, uh, bought about uh, twenty WPAD.TLDs. And it could be a subject of another presentation because we had a lot of uh, traffic from that as well. So if people are not aware of WPAD, we, we published a paper called Waiting Passionately for an Announced Disaster a yep. year ago about all the things that can and do go wrong about uh, WPAD. It's a total disaster. Yep. And, and it's, it's, it's enabled by default on all the Windows machines. Yep. But with this research, what I, I wanted to uh, say is even if WPAD is disabled, 
uh, with the DNS uh, discovery from Active Directory domain, we can still exploit uh, a lot of this. Anyone else? Nobody wants to buy local.ed? It didn't look very profitable, though. But <laughs> thank you, Philippe. Thank you.